Good morning, and welcome to worship today on the Feast of the Transfiguration of Our Lord. My name is Pastor Seth Novak, and on behalf of the entire community of Unused Day Lutheran Church, I'd like to thank you for being a part of this worship service today. Our building may be closed, but the church is still open. You can download a worship bulletin with the order of service from the link in the video description below. Today, in addition to being Valentine's Day, is the commemoration day for Saints Cyril and Methodius. The brothers were born in Thessalonica, Greece, in the middle of the 9th century. They're known for bringing the gospel to the Slavic peoples of Central and Eastern Europe. They invented a written alphabet called Cyrillic, named after Cyril, to provide a vernacular translation of the Bible, and they developed a Slavonic liturgy that was approved for use by the Pope. They faced many challenges and years of political and theological controversy with the neighboring German hierarchy, but their legacy among the Slavic peoples lives to this day. The alphabet and the liturgical language still used in Slavic countries are adapted from the pair's original work. Millions of Orthodox Christians around the world owe the roots of their traditions to Cyril and Methodius. We're glad to be gathered with them today. On a related note, remembering Saints Cyril and Methodius always reminds me of a saint from Agnus Day, Maureen Rivnes. Uh, Cyril and Methodius are widely celebrated in the Czech Republic. And not long after I came, Maureen and I bonded over our shared Czech language. In 2016, February 14th landed on a, on a Sunday, and I uh, talked about Saints Cyril and Methodius then, and she was very excited to uh, hear me share about that. Maureen died a few years ago, but I'm really glad to have that reminder of her today. Before we begin our worship this morning, uh, we'd like to take a moment just to share some prayer concerns from our community. If you have any prayer concerns you'd like to share, I'll invite you to add them now in the chat or the comments, being mindful of privacy in this public space. Today we remember in prayer uh, our friend Rob P., who is in the hospital after falling from his horse on Monday. He's stable and improving, uh, hoping to come home soon. We ask prayers for him and for Joanna as he recovers, uh, especially for speedy healing. We also uh, pray for Sharon Crump's friend, uh, her lifelong friend, Kara, who is undergoing treatment for cancer today. With that, I'll invite you to turn, turn to your bulletin as we begin our worship. We gather in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world. 
calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood, you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintop into our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world with your image. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from 2 Corinthians. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became a dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared with him Elijah and Moses talking with Jesus. 
Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountains, he ordered them to tell no one what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Over the years, I've noticed that whenever I read this story or hear it read, we always put the emphasis in the message from the voice on the verb. We say, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. The implication, then, is that we, like Peter, are too busy trying to talk, to come up with answers, to fill the silence, or just calm ourselves down, that we have a hard time listening to what we're being told. But today, as I read this, I begin to wonder if we shouldn't instead be reading the verse with the emphasis on the direct object of the sentence. This is my son, beloved. Listen to him. I mean, let's consider the scene here, right? Peter suddenly finds himself in the presence of Moses and Elijah, two of the most colossal figures in Jewish history. Imagine standing on the mall in Washington, D.C., and all of a sudden having George Washington and Abraham Lincoln standing beside you. Peter is absolutely starstruck. Here he is with his rabbi and the greatest lawgiver and the greatest prophet of all time. Of course, he wants to take advantage of their wisdom. He wants to sit at their feet and learn from them all that he can learn. He's so amazed by these historical celebrities that he somehow seems to become blind to the literally dazzling figure of his own rabbi standing right in front of him. The words from the cloud maybe aren't an admonition for him to stop talking and start listening, but a reminder to him of whom he ought to be paying attention to. I've heard a lot of people speculate over the years about what Jesus and Moses and Elijah were talking about. Were they debating the finer points of the law or maybe commiserating over the burden of speaking to God's people on God's behalf? Some have thought that this scene demonstrates that Jesus is uh, as good as the, as on par as with these great people from history. But I wonder if this story doesn't function a little bit like the story of Jesus as a temple, as a boy in the temple from uh, St. Luke's Gospel. Luke tells that story to show that even as a 12-year-old, Jesus had the knowledge and the authority to teach the teachers. Maybe here Mark is showing us that Jesus has the knowledge and the authority to teach even the greatest teachers of all time, that he is greater than Moses and Elijah. Peter is starstruck by meeting these great historical figures, but maybe the point of this story is that he ought to be more starstruck by the man he's already been following for nine chapters. It seems to me that like Peter, our problem isn't listening. <clears throat> we try very, very hard to listen. To listen and to imitate, and to extrapolate, and to obey the wisdom that we find in Scripture. I think that we're actually pretty good at listening. The more pressing challenge is figuring out to whom we should be listening. We all of us have all kinds of teachers in our lives, past and present. Pastors and Sunday school teachers and preachers and theologians and Bible scholars and books, all very eager to tell us exactly what God wants us to do and how God wants us to do it. Unfortunately, you don't need to listen very long to figure out that many of these teachers disagree with one another. Even though we're all looking at the same source of authority, at the same Bible, we so often come away with very, very different conclusions about what is right and moral and just. Last week, our congregation undertook an exercise in listening. We took a seemingly simple question, what is the church's role in society? And we looked at three seemingly simple possibilities. <clears throat> One was that the church ought to be a place of refuge, a place where people can leave their differences at the door 
and come together over what we have in common. Another was that the church ought to be a place of mediation, a place where we can create a safe space to fairly consider all options and perspectives with curiosity and respect. The third was that the church ought to be a prophetic voice, confidently separating right from wrong and calling people to lead a holy and moral life. What we found as we listened was that this simple answer didn't, excuse me, this simple question didn't have any simple answers. We wrestled with these three possibilities, finding merits and drawbacks in all of them. And we wondered if they really needed to be mutually exclusive or if there was room for two or even three of them in the church's ministry at different times and in different places. We didn't come to, the, to a conclusion about what the role of our congregation should be in our society. But we did notice that regardless of whatever opinions we might have had about each option, <clears throat> we heard a lot of common motivations behind all of them. We all thought that the church ought to be a place that is open to as many people as possible. A place where people feel loved and respected and where everyone has a voice. We all wanted to remain true to our tradition and our identity as Christian people, while also respecting the dignity and the integrity of traditions and identities around us. We all wanted to do our best to follow the direction of God. Above all, there was a great concern for helping and caring for the people around us. Sometimes these motivations are best served by uh, being a refuge, focusing on what we have in common rather than what separates us. Sometimes by making room to discuss our differing opinions and interpretations of scripture. Sometimes by taking a stand on what we believe to be non-negotiable, especially when it comes to protecting folks who've been marginalized and placed in vulnerable positions. We didn't think that the church should back down from the challenge of trying to address these problems of the world but we saw that there are different ways to do that. We recognize that people come to the church from many different places in their faith journeys, and we hoped that the church might be able to provide a way for people in each place to engage in a way that was meaningful and true to who they felt God calling them to be. We arrived at these observations by listening, but it is to whom we were listening that makes this exercise valuable. It's my experience that we often want someone in a place of authority, a teacher or a pastor or a bishop, to tell us what the answers are. But those authorities can only tell us what they think and the conclusions to which they have come. In this exercise, we listen to each other. And when we listen to each other, we recognize the authority that each of us has from our own life experience, our education, our own faithful pondering these questions. It's not just the case that any one of us, not even teachers or pastors or bishops, have the overwhelming authority of Moses or Elijah. What we do have together is the authority of Jesus. Authority that comes not from knowledge or experience or expertise, but from our connection to God through the Holy Spirit. When we come together as a church, we are transfigured the whole becomes more than the sum of its parts. We become more than just a collection of individuals. We become a collection of individuals washed in baptism and sharing a common calling. In other words, we become a collection of individuals in whom God is at work. The Spirit moves among us as we interact with one another, as we learn from and teach each other, and as we grow both as individuals and as a community. Somewhere in those interactions, in the spaces between us, God is at work moving us in the direction God wants us to go. It's a messy process, and it's terribly inefficient. But for better or for worse, that's the process which God has chosen to bring us closer to God's vision of wholeness. We don't always get it right. Sometimes we make horrible mistakes and people get hurt. But it's the best way that we have to listen to God. It's the process God has chosen to bring us closer to God's vision of wholeness, the vision that Jesus called the kingdom of God. 
Although we did not decide on what role our congregation should take in society, we did decide that having that conversation is valuable. What this tells me is that that might be where God is calling us now, to be in conversation with one another about this and other things. We are so hungry to listen, and I think that we began to recognize the voice of God in that act of listening to our community. Of course, our listening is not perfect, in part because our community is not perfect. We recognize that as we deliberated, that there are voices that are not in that conversation with us. We are a congregation composed primarily of older, privileged white people. We wondered in our time together what perspectives and wisdom might be added by inviting other voices belonging to younger adults and children, people living in the margins, people of color. I also heard people reflect on the reality that we are not always very good at inviting people in general. and We wonder how we might do better. I find that last question particularly edifying because whenever we in the church start to talk about inviting others into our congregations, it's always in the context of growing our membership or our giving base or supporting our ministries. But what if instead we were to think about how those we invite might change our congregations, might be a part of creating new ministries or new patterns, might even change how we experience church entirely. What if inviting others into our congregation might be God's way of transfiguring our entire concept of what the church is and does, how it operates, making it brighter than anyone on earth could possibly make it? That thought scares us as much as that moment on the mountain scared Peter and James and John. But what if that is where Jesus is calling us? leading us up the mountain apart by ourselves. Shouldn't we listen to him rather than our own instincts to build more sanctuaries and classrooms? I'll admit that that conversation last week didn't quite go how I expected it to go. There's a lot of things that I would have changed if I could have, but that's part of what makes this so great to experience. Even though it didn't go quite how I thought it should, the Holy Spirit was there, moving among us, helping us to think and change and grow, transfiguring us all into something new. I'm excited to continue that conversation with you all, to invite new voices into that conversation. I'm excited by the prospect of finding uh, where we might end up, but also how we might get there. And perhaps most importantly, who we might become in the process.
Let us join our hearts together in prayer. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. For the whole church, its ministry and the mission of the gospel. For the well being of creation. For peace and justice in the world, the nations and those in authority and our local community. For the poor, oppressed, sick, bereaved, lonely. For all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. For Anya's day and for the people closest to us. For the faithful departed. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. When we were in darkness, the light of the world came into our midst. The feast and the season of Epiphany celebrate the coming of this light among us in the person of Jesus, who shows us the way of abundant life. One of the ways we continue to share and experience that abundant life is through the ministries of this congregation. As members and friends of Anya's Day, we gather and support one another in loving community. We worship together in the hope of healing for this pandemic and beyond. We lift up our neighbors through programs like Fish Food Bank, Food Backpacks for Kids, and the Peninsula Gig Harbor Homelessness Coalition. We nurture the faith of Christians of all ages through forums and Sunday school and confirmation classes. All of this is made possible by your contributions to our ministry. If you'd like to join me in making sure that our ministries continue to grow in this time of a pandemic, you can follow the link in the video description below to make a one-time donation or to set up a recurring gift to support on you stay. Thank you for your dedication to this community and this work. Oh.
this time, I'll invite you to prepare your hearts and your tables to share in the Lord's Supper. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, creator of heaven and earth. You rescued your covenant people, led them on all their journeys, and taught them by the prophets. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O God, in this meal and make us one in this community of faith with your people throughout the world. Glory and praise to you, O God, author of life, word made flesh, power of the Most High, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you're not receiving the meal this morning, receive this blessing. May you hear the voice of Jesus clearly guiding you always. Amen. If you are receiving a meal this morning, hear these words of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is abundant. Amen.
by your hand to feed your people, food of angels, heaven's bread. For these gifts we did not labor, by your grace have we been fed. Christ own body, blessed and broken, cup or flowing life outpoured, given as a living token of your world redeemed, restored. In this meal we taste your sweetness, bread for hunger, wine of peace, holy Satisfy our deepest needs. Christ on body, blessed and broken, cup or flowing life outpoured, given as a living token of your world redeemed, restored. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, at this table we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet, nourished in body and in spirit, to proclaim your good news and serve others in your name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Before we conclude today, I'd like to share just a few announcements. First, I'd like to thank everyone who participated in our forum discussion these past two weeks and who not only helped our congregation work through a process of self-discovery and finding our voice, but also helped contribute to uh, our proclamation of the good news today. This congregation is a community of people seeking God and striving to live out our baptismal vocation together. And I think that this conversation has uh, been a step that we've taken along that path, a really good step. Thanks also to everyone who helped build our mighty toilet paper fortress. We collected uh, 1,128 rolls to donate to Fish Food Bank. So that's a big number, uh, but how many is that? Well, to put that in perspective, last year uh, we collected an all-time high of 1,736 rolls. That means that this year, in the midst of a pandemic and with off and on toilet paper shortages, we still collected uh, two thirds of that, which is really remarkable. And I think that speaks to the really enthusiastic generosity of this congregation and the incredible work that God is doing here among us. This, folks, is why I am still hopeful and excited for this congregation, even in the midst of pandemic. Our building may be closed, but as I keep saying, the church is still open. God is not done with us yet. We have been given all kinds of gifts to share, and not even a pandemic can stop us from sharing them. With a community like this, it's impossible not to be hopeful. Um, as we look forward to next week, uh, I will be gone from February 15th through 21st. Um, leading worship for us next week will be Pastor Jason Chestnut. I'm grateful to Pastor Chestnut for his help, and I look forward to hearing his message next week, because I can do that now that our worship is online. I can catch it at another time. So that's kind of the fun thing about the way we worship these days. Even if one of us isn't able to gather on a Sunday morning, we can still worship together. So that's kind of neat. Um, also coming up in two weeks, starting Saturday, February 22nd, you are invited to join a socially distanced vigil for racial justice along Peacock Hill Avenue. A group of folks from Anis Day will be gathering weekly on Saturdays, starting on the 27th, at the church at 2.45 p.m. And then they'll stand along the sidewalk from 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, we've made some signs declaring what we stand for, things like racial equality, voting rights, human dignity, things like that. And those signs are intended to be shared. Um, once you come and get a, a sense of what that's about, you may even want to bring your own signs. 
I'd also like to remind you that you can be a superhero this month by leaving your donations of canned food, or excuse me, canned soup for food backpacks for kids in the bin outside the front door of the church. Donations will be collected all this month. And while you're dropping off your soup, you can also pick up our new Grab and Go Sunday School kits for this month, as well as uh, devotional kits for Lent and Holy Week. Uh, those things will be in bins in the front of the church. Once again, I just want to thank you for being a part of this worship service today. If you found today's service meaningful, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can gather right here with On You Stay for worship every Sunday at 9.45 a.m. I'd also like to invite you to make On You Stay a part of your week. On Wednesday, we will be having our weekly text study at 10 a.m. to look at the lessons for the coming Sunday, uh, led by Pastor Chestnut this week. And the Knitters group will be meeting from at 1.30 p.m. You can find links to these Zoom gatherings and other activities happening in our congregation under the events tab on our website, onyoustaylutheran.org. Now go in peace. Shine with the light of Christ. Amen. I'd like to invite you to share the peace of Christ with someone you know with a call or a text or an email or by sharing this uh, worship service with them or on your social media page so that uh, you can worship together. God bless you in your week.